The first piece I've chosen to look at is perhaps one of the most impressive beginnings of any story in the English language. It's uh, Moby Dick. Okay, so I'm going to read Moby Dick out and I'm going to then look at this very short passage here, how he put it together. And then we're going to look at that. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. It is a way I have of driving off the spleen and regulating the circulation. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off, then I account it high time to get to sea as soon as I can. This is my substitute for pistol and ball. With a philosophical flourish, Cato throws himself upon his sword. I quietly take to the ship. There is nothing surprising in this. If they but knew it, almost all men in their degree, some time or other, cherish very nearly the same feelings towards the ocean with me. So you remember that we talked about how prose has the same qualities of music, a good prose has the same qualities of music, and those are rhythm, sound and repetition. And we also said how in addition to the musicality of it, we have an additional aspect with language which is meaning. So we can play with the meaning as well. Um, but first we're going to look at the basic rhythm of a piece of prose. So the first thing that we do is with the sentence length and you will have noticed really early on in your writing career that just by alternating the length of your sentences you can create a pleasing effect and I was reading a book of, about journalism uh, Storycraft by Jack Hart and he said that the beginning journalists could get kudos by just writing sentences of different lengths so the basic thing is the rhythm of the sentence length and I suppose the understanding about this is that it's uh, to do with the big beat that comes at the end of a sentence so we're not talking about meaning here at all we're talking about um, rhythm and musicality so first thing so we start with a short sentence da 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 yeah and then a longer sentence da 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 da, and that's a basic um, beat of a piece of prose. The next thing that we can do is get a bit more um, detailed with our rhythm, and that is by changing our sentence types and our sentence uh, structures. So, if you think that a sentence is a basic sentence is one thought, we don't just usually in writing, certainly not in speech have one thought in a sentence. So what we do is we add little bits and usually the convention is to add those as clauses. So we have the main sense of the sentence and then we have a clause that we add on that um, adds to the sense of the sentence, okay? But this creates a rhythm within the sentence depending on which sentence type we use. Now I did a course by John Fox, Book Fox on sentence length and structure it was really helpful, so um, I would recommend that course. Uh, I don't get any kickback for that, I'm just saying it was a good course. And then I started reading a lot of books about sentences. So there are actually a lot of books about sentences that you can read, and if you didn't, if you didn't think there were, there's a whole uh, literature devoted to how you write a good sentence. Remember we're talking about deliberate practice. So deliberate practice means chaining together basic skills like a golfer will practice the swing and the putt and all these and then or a football or a baseball player and then we add or, a, or a, a violinist and then we add these things so the musician practices scales and in a sense the sentence is our basic structure 
the different kinds of sentences we can we can have are the simple sentence which just has one thought boom that's your basic and that is that can be very useful particularly after you've had a long run of complex sentences to end with a simple short sentence or to begin a short simple sentence and then have a complex run of sentences other types of sentences we might use are what john fox calls a leaning sentence and so that is usually a sentence with one clause and we put the clause at the beginning or at the end and depending on where we put it can change the feel of the sentence it changes the emphasis so we tend to feel that the thing we put first is the most emphasized for example after having lunch he went to see his grandma so the main sentence is he went to see his grandma but we tag a clause on after having lunch he went to see his grandma. But we can also have, he went to see his grandma after having lunch. And that changes it remarkably. Okay, so that's the, the basic is the short sentence. Then we have a, a leaning sentence, as John Fox calls it. But we can get even more complex than that, and most writers do. And the, the first um, important type of sentence that we'll see in much of the stuff we look at is the periodic sentence. And this um, nomenclature of comma, period, goes right back to rhetoric in the Roman times and it was about how they saw a piece of, uh, of speech usually, because remember the first function of language is speech and only secondarily do we write it down. Um, and I still feel that writing is actually for the ear, sometimes for the inner ear, uh, you're not reading it out loud, but still it has an, you still hear it. Okay, so the periodic sentence. Now in English we tend to be verb second, so we tend to have the uh, subject first. I saw this man yesterday. Okay, so I, subject, saw, verb, this man, object, yesterday is uh, an adjective, so it's a, it's a secondary thought. Now other languages don't do that, this is just a diversion. For example, um, in Welsh, you would say you put your verb first. In Celtic languages, you put your verb first. So you have um, Gwil I see a dean hun voi. Okay, so I saw I, not I saw. Okay, now in some languages, we put the verb in complex sentences second. So for example, in German, Ich dieser Mann gestern Abend gesehen haben. So I, this man, yesterday evening, saw have yeah so the, the main thing comes at the end and that is actually a periodic sentence latin does it as well sometimes alia yacta est the dice thrown is okay so what that does with a periodic sentence is it delays the meaning to the very end and if we chain clauses up we can actually create a sense of, a tease really, a sense of anticipation, and we pay it off at the final sentence. And that has a, can have a profound effect on the piece of writing. So that is to do with sense, but it's also the musicality of it as well. Because if you think about it, each subclause is a, is a minor beat. So we might have da, 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 almost like a drum roll, da, 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 and then we pay it off at the end. And you'll see that is that is used uh, very effectively by a lot of great prose stylists and writers. So that's the periodic sentence. Okay. We can also have what we call a cumulative sentence, and the the, the names of these actually changes in some of the literature. But the cumulative sentence begins with the main verb. So we say, "I saw the man yesterday in the park on my way home with my wife on a sunny day." So. So then what you have is like an, an echoing. So probably the sentences you're going to write aren't as banal as what I've just done, but you know, firstly you have boom, and then t -t 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 -t, like an echo. So that's a cumulative sentence, a cumulative because you add to the main sense. But remember when we're talking about rhythm, what we're talking about is the, 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 the beat of it. So boom, t -t 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 -t, the cumulative sentence. And what you find also a third type of sentence, and this is really common in Victorian writing when they went in for really long, complex sentences. And you also find it in somebody like Ray Russell who pastiches Victorian writing in something like Sardonicus. And um, what you have is you have a thought and it's 
constantly interrupted by interjections. And um, Henry James does this. And remember, my primary kind of function these days is a narrator of, of stories, so I read stories out. And Henry James is murder to read because the rhythm of it is so chopped up. And it is a feeling like a, a, a choppy sea. But it can be effective as well. The portrait of Dorian Gray as well, you know, so classic Victorian stuff. You have an idea and, and then you go off on a tangent and then you add to it that and then you come back. And that's a, like a clatter. It's almost very sophisticated, symphonic kind of thing, you know, more more like a symphony than a, than a rock song. Um, uh, and Although it's hard to read, it can be effective. It can be very effective. Uh, and if we, I'm not, remember, I'm not really here to talk about story structure, but if you think about the Thousand and One Nights and the particularly Arabic storytelling, where they would tell, tell a story within a story, within a story, within a story. So you start off with the main story, you have a sub-story, then you have a sub-story based on that, then you have a sub-story based on that one, and eventually, very neatly and cleverly, you resolve the whole thing like a nest of Russian dolls. And so the, the complex, um, as I call it, the interrupted sentence, I call it the interrupted sentence because the rhythm is interrupted and quite complex. Now, you have to be a real master of the art to make that sound good because it can otherwise just sound like a clatter uh, a clattering cacophonic thing but if you get your rhythms and i think ray russell for example does do this you can be really effective with the uh, interrupted sentence the complex sentence the first thing i want to look at about that selection of moby dick is the rhythm and the first effect to create rhythm is the alternation of sentence lengths a sentence is a thought, we always used to say. It can actually be a number of thoughts. The simple sentence is one thought, but we can have sub-clauses, and then we, we have a full stop or a period at the end. Uh, the correct word is period, in fact, and that's the ancient term, even though in British English we tend to say full stop, but period is older, and it goes back to the theories of commas and periods, and, and that was to do with the, the completeness of a piece of writing. Okay, I'll talk about that another time. So we have a short sentence, then a stop, boom, pause. And then we have a longer sentence. And what we find is these bigger pauses, and I suppose, in, you know, in music, there are different, there are lightnesses of beats, aren't there? There's a heavy beat and a lighter beat. And this is a heavy beat. So the end of a sentence is a heavy beat. And if we, if we alternate our sentences, somehow we find that pleasing. So in this, we have call me Ishmael, three words. And we look at the next sentence is really quite long. And then there's a shorter sentence and then there's an enormously long sentence. And then one, two, three, four short sentences and a medium sentence. And if we look at those, we look at those uh, sentence lengths, we have a three word sentence, a 40 word sentence, a 15 word sentence, an 87 word sentence, then eight, 10, six, six, and 26. And this, all, this um, variety of rhythm we find very pleasing to the ear. I think we can say more about the sentence length. I think there's more to a sentence than just a full, full stop or a period at the end. We talked about the heavy and light beats. So if we say that the, the period is the heavy beat, then we get lots of different light beats in the middle. And these are the clauses. And these are to do with sense as well. So we can have a sentence with a, a clause and then a main sentence. And so we have the plain, call me Ishmael, boom. But then there's a sentence called a periodic sentence. And how that happens is the main clause is at the very end of a chain of sub-clauses. So the main sentence, the meaning is at the end. And we have a whole series of this. So let, let's look at this. This is what's called a periodic sentence. And we find in this Moby Dick, what we have is that Melville uses the periodic sentence and there's a really long one here. So let's go. Remember, we, we chain the clauses together and then at the end we get the meaning. And this is a rhythmic thing. So it's little beat, little beat, little beat, little beat, big beat. You know, that's what it goes like. So here, whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, he just slips another clause in there. And especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me that it requires another clause, that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically, so he's, he's repeating those adverbs there, deliberately and methodically, and that has a rhythmic effect. 
knocking people's hats off, then I count it high time to get to see as soon as I can. So the whole point about that is he's kept us waiting through all those clauses, and then he tells us at the end, it's high time to get to see, bang. And that is, that's a periodic sentence. So the second sentence is a periodic sentence as well. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse, and nothing particular to interest me on shore, all those clauses are leading us up to what he's going to do, I thought I would sail about a little, and that would have been a perfect periodic sentence. But he adds another clause at the end, and see the watery part of the world, so he kind of dilutes it there. I don't know whether that makes it better, it's worth a thought, or whether he deliberately did that, I don't know. Just for reference, though, there isn't one in this selection, the opposite of a periodic sentence, whereby we have a chain of clauses, then the bung, the end, so we have little pot, little beat, little beat, little beat, little beat, big beat. Sometimes we can have a big beat, little beat, little beat, little beat, little beat, and we have the main clause and we have sub-clauses going off, chained off, um, which gives a kind of an echo effect, and we would call that a cumulative sentence. So we, we say what we've got to say, and then we add to it, but there isn't one in this selection. The length of the sentences and the arrangement of the clauses to produce a particular pattern of beats is part of the musicality of prose. Other aspects are, of course, the sound, because music, of course, the tones, the notes, the variance of the different sounds is a very important part. And we see this also here. There are different devices for sound, such as assonance, pararime, and rhyme, of course. But here we have alliteration. There's no rhyme I can see in it. I don't notice any obvious pararime. My ear isn't good enough to hear the uh, assonance, if there is any, but there's certainly a lot of alliteration. And in fact, we have to be careful as writers, we don't overdo it, so we can actually use a technique so it becomes tedious. And if you come across Anglo-Saxon verse, or people who write in that style, certainly Tolkien did this with his, uh, some of his poems, Beren and Luthien and things like that, are written in alliterative verse. Sometimes the, the repetition of a particular sound can be too tedious and we have to break it up. I don't think Melville's guilty of that. If you hear, never mind, nothing, sail about and see the watery part of the world growing grim, damp, drizzly. So he does use it and it, it can sound really good, but he doesn't overuse it, I don't think. And now we come on to Melville's formal use of rhetorical devices, the flowers of rhetoric. He uses anaphora. So anaphora is where we begin a clause or a sentence with the same phrase. So it's not just at the level of a sound, it's a pattern of sounds that we repeat. And of course he does this most famously in this with uh, whenever. I think there's a near miss as well with um, methodically, or I'm not sure what you would call this, but it is similar in that he repeats those two adverbs deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off. Certainly there is a symmetry there, that the sentence is the same, so it's almost an isocolon really. So deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off. The, the sentence is balanced, so we have adverb, participle, and then the action part of it. Deliberately stepping into the street, methodically knocking people's hats off. And we have, of course, the big an aphora of whenever, whenever, whenever. The next thing that um, he does quite a lot is to use doublets and join to nouns with either and or or. So we have little or no money, pistol and ball, sometime or other. These are not there for the sense of them because little or no money doesn't really mean much more really than no money. Pistol and ball, you could get away with just writing pistol and sometime or other you could get away with just writing sometime. So they're not there for the sense of them. They're not there because of the added information they give you. They're there for the rhythmic sound of it. And then we've also talked, we talked a little bit about Nisocolon as well. Cato throws himself upon his sword. I quietly take to the ship. So you can see the symmetry in those sentences. Cato does this, I do that. It's not quite an Isocolon. The classic Isocolon is the equivalence of structure. So roses are red, violets are blue. And you don't join them with an and or an or and a but. Roses are red, full stop. Violets are blue, full stop. So it's not quite the same because he, he, he should say something like Cato roughly throws himself. So it's not quite the same, but there's equivalence there in this structure. The final thing to say is about aphorisms. If, if you, once you know this, you will just look at the world completely differently. 
Aphorisms are where we say things to be generally true. All men are this. All times are that. He says, all men cherish things like I do. And he's making a general truth. All men, everybody, all horses. And, you know, we, we swallow these. People say these things abs- that have no grounding in fact or truth at all, but because they're stated as an aphorism, as a truth, we kind of go, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So all men in their degree, sometime or other, cherish very nearly the same feeling towards the ocean as me. I don't think so. So an aphorism is supposed to be a pithy observation that contains a general truth. And I think very often they may be pithy observations, but mostly they don't contain any truth at all. Actions speak louder than words. Not always. All for one and one for all. What? Don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. I mean, you know, if you took that advice, you may end up dead. Give him an inch and he'll take a mile. And you can see the rhythm in these as well, you know. If you lie down with dogs, you wake up with fleas. So that's a, an isocolon. He who hesitates is lost. These are not necessarily true at all, but because they're expressed rhetorically, so they're using things like isocolon structure, they're using a, a, a rhythm, they use alliteration. Laugh in the world laughs with you, weep and you weep alone. That's a chiasmus. You use rhetorical techniques and you, leave, and you dump them out there in the world and people go, ah, oh, yes, that's true. And generally it's not. And so I, I don't feel I have much in common with Ishmael who wants to go and uh, hunt great white whales and go to sea. I've never fancied it myself. So we don't be fooled by aphorisms. There we are. That's the end of our look at Moby Dick. There's probably a lot more to be said about this little passage, but what we've just done is look at a very short piece of writing and see that there are formal techniques that Melville uses about rhythm, about sound, about repetition which make this stand out. And really, when you boil it down, what bright idea has he really expressed? Yeah, that, you know, you're a bit miserable, so you're going to get out of town for a bit. Okay, if you said that to your mate in a pub, it wouldn't be particularly profound. But because Melville says that with all the gifts of his formal education in writing and using rhetoric and using devices to make his prose sound better, It is a pretty memorable opening to a book, possibly one of the most famous in the English language. And it's, to me, it's not down to the smart idea, but it's down to the way he says it so exquisitely. A very short passage, but it unpacks into a great deal of learning. When we start to look at the micro detail of how Herman Melville puts his sentences together and the formal skills he uses, this is not accidental. He is working from a playbook like Shakespeare, People who studied rhetoric had a manual of how you should put sentences together. And to me, this is like you taught your golf strokes and then you go off and you you use the skills you taught and inevitably you put your own colour on them. But the micro skills are the basic ones that everybody's taught. And this is basically what we've looked at with Moby Dick. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Remember, if you did, um, this is a new channel, so just uh, subscribe, like, and uh, comment if you wish. Uh, I'm, I'm a fellow student trying to learn from the masters.